Wow, so beautiful. Thank you, guys. What a song. What a Savior. The title of today's message is Female Dog, Female Dog, Female Dog. I guess I better let that sink in for a minute. So here's a few stories. For the past 20 years, my wife has been complaining about me not putting the cap back on the toothpaste. Last anniversary, I decided to change this bad habit and make my wife happy. For a week, I was diligent, always capping the toothpaste. I was expecting my wife to thank me, but she never did. Finally, last night, she turned and looked at me and said, why have you stopped brushing your teeth? (laughs) You may live in that house. Another one, marriage is a difficult relationship, I tell you. My wife was complaining that I never buy her flowers. I didn't even know she sold them. So, think about that. My girlfriend was complaining last night that I never listened to her or something like that. Um, Last one, it's going to end. My wife and I were woken up at 3 a.m. by a loud banging on our door. I got up, opened the door, and there was a drunken stranger standing in the pouring rain asking for a push. Are you insane, man? It's three in the morning. I screamed, slamming the door, and stormed back to bed. Who was that? Asked my wife. Just some drunk asking for a push, I grumbled. Did you help him? She asked. No, I did not. It's 3 a.m. and it's pouring rain. Well, you have a short memory. She said, you don't remember three months ago when we broke down and those two guys helped us. You should be ashamed of yourself. Now get out there and help him. She had a point, and angrily I got up, I got dressed, went out into the darkness calling, hello, are you there? Yes. Do you still need a push? Yes, please. Where are you? Over here on the swing. Okay, so. So. Okay, that's over. (laughs) <laughs> Maya Angelou said this, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. Don't complain. Dale Carnegie, any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do. Mark Twain, don't complain and talk about all your problems. 80% of the people don't care, and the other 20% are glad you have them. Zig Ziglar, be grateful for what you have and stop complaining. It bores everyone else, does you no good, and doesn't solve any problems. Henry Ford, don't find fault, find a remedy. Anybody can complain. Harlan Coben, complaining about a problem without posing a solution is called whining. Turn to Exodus 15. So... We're taking, uh, we're coming at this a little bit from a negative point of view, but we'll land in the right spot. So Exodus 15, um, the people of Israel have been in captivity for hundreds of years in Egypt. Finally, God hears their, their, their prayer, sends Moses, boom, miraculously, all the plagues, finally, let my people go, let my people go. Finally, Pharaoh's like, get the, you know, get out of here. Even lets them take their stuff. And so they escape bondage, and they're going through this wilderness, to this promised land. And so it started out okay, Exodus 15, 1. Then Moses, now look at this, it's not just Moses. Moses and the children of Israel sang. So it's not just Moses singing, it's everybody singing this. The song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Talking about them crossing the sea, the water parted for the Israel, came in on the Egyptians. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is, is his name. This Goes on and on. Go down to verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? 
You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. So you think, wow, they get it. They're praising God. They're singing songs. They're excited. It's going to be great. Exodus 16, one chapter later. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Here it goes. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. What? When we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Zero trust. Now let me say this early and I may repeat it again in the end. You cannot thank God and whine and complain and female dog at the same time. It's not possible. Now you say, well, oh, I, I, I go into his presence and I, and I'm, I have concerns and I'm, I'm afraid. No, that's one thing. But if you think you're going to go into the presence of God and worship him and be beaten on him with, I'm tired of the, you know, just lighten him up because you don't like your life or what he's allowed, it's not going to turn out into any worship, any kind of thanksgiving. Go to Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. And this is one example. I only got so much time, so one example. Numbers 11, verse 1. Now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. God is not a fan of complainers. Now, we got this gr amazing thing here in this church, and if you want to visit, it's a, it's a very, it, it's, it's not normal. We don't have a lot of complainers. I, if you're a complainer, raise your hand. See, we, we don't have any. Um, we got a few people that get sideways every once in a while and start, you know, barking a little bit. But, but when you love God and when you love each other and you're trying to serve him and trust him and keep moving forward as a church, like, you know, some churches, this is why it gets so, I grew up with this crazy stuff. Churches would like build a building and or redo a building, and then you, it's, it's insanity. Then some person would come in and go, I don't like the color of the pew pads. Just sit down and worship. Who cares what color the pew pads are? I don't like the color of the carpet. I don't, I, 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 that's not what we're here for. We're not in the barn business, we're in the sheep business. Forget, it's a barn. But you get your focus on all these things. Focus on him. If you see him, you will not be able to complain. And for some of you, obviously I'm saying not in this room. This sermon is for people way, way beyond here. No one here. Um, it's, it's not going to go well. Now, you say, well, but you, you, you don't really know me. Oh, so like you're, you really are a complainer. You just dress it up here to show up. Um, there are people that are just negative. It's, it's negative past. It's just complain. Like nothing's ever right. Um, I can get really impatient. I've told you about me calling 800 numbers and getting sideways. I'm doing better. Um, you know, you, well, you're just trying to let them do a better job. Not if you're being an idiot about it, right? Not if my attitude is terrible and I'm upset and all spun up. It's, you're, you're, you're li you don't feel good when you complain. You think you do, but you don't. And especially if you're married. If, if you're married and one of you is a complainer, it's, it's going to blow your house up. Well, I don't like this. Well, you did that. And blah, 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 blah. Female dog, female dog, female dog. See, I've, I'm very careful. I'm censoring things. Where's my sensor over here? My sensor's over here. Somewhere. Numbers 11. Verse 4, now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. Emphasis implied. 
There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. So, what, so this applies to some people. I had this conversation with a guy recently. He's lived a jacked up sinful life. He's making a transition through kind of a wilderness of sorts of relationships and trying to figure out what it's going to be like on the other side. So God may be taking you to a better place and it may be uncomfortable on the way. Stop complaining about, oh, how great it was when you were this tremendous sinner. You wouldn't have left that place in the first place if it had been so great. It sucked. It was killing you. And so you said, I don't want to live there anymore. I don't want to be this person anymore. So you change, and now you embark on this journey, and God's saying, I got new friends. I got new stuff for you. Just trust me. Hang in there. But you say, but, I, but I don't, we're not there yet. So you have to trust him in that interim period, or you're not going to make it. You'll slide back. And I promise you, if you go back, there's nothing there. It's just pain and sorrow and emptiness. It doesn't work. So hang on. You say, but I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I, I, don't, I don't know what the future looks like. That's why they call it faith. So you say, God, I can't see, but I can, but I can, I trust you. And I, so I trust that you can see what I can't see. And I'm going to be okay till I see it. And so that gives you the ability to be here now and not know what's out there. Um, and, and wait without complaining. Numbers 14, 27. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against, <clears throat> against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Like how long, you know, I'm not going to do this indefinitely. Deuteronomy 1, 27. And you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us. Now God hates me because it's not going my way. Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. That's not anywhere in scripture that that was his plan. We come up with that. The second you stop trusting and believing, you go into this mode of, oh, woe is me, and it's not going to work. It's, oh, it's going to be terrible, and we're all going to die. Like, what? The sky is falling. And it never goes anywhere. It never fixes anything. Nothing. Right? Something terrible happens to you. And you start complaining about what happened. It's not changing anything. Nothing. What happened to you has already happened to you. Well, but I want to be upset about it. Okay, and what is that going to accomplish? Well, I feel better. No, you don't. And everyone around you is not feeling better. Enough already. Let's move forward. Psalm 106. Yeah, I don't want an answer to this question I'm about to pose, but if you, if you interviewed my wife and she was really 100% honest with you and you asked her, like, what just drives you crazy about the man, but because you love him, you just let it go. You'll be there a while. You'll be there quite a while. <laughs> Psalm 106, everybody there? Verse 24, then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Now it's talking about they despised the pleasant land. You're not happy even if it's good. So once you go down this path, and this is your, this is your, your fuel of choice for your life, you're just going to groan, moan, mumble, complain, you can't get enough. Then even when it all gets great, you are so addicted to that nonsense, you get there and you're still not happy. You'll find something. Oh, I thought the sun was going to come up this way on the beach, not that way. Like, you're on the other side of the... Like, what? Gosh, I just want so bad to say, are you married to this person? But I do not, it's like not that time of year, so I'll let that go. <laughs> if you are this person, stop it. Stop it. 
You're destroying your life and everyone around you. You're destroying possibly your marriage. Stop it. It's never okay. Why, why can it not be okay? Why can't you just be grateful for what you have? Amen. Now somebody's going to walk in here and say, well, I'm not going back there because he, he embarrassed me. What? <laughs> well, I felt like everyone was looking at me. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> Stop complaining about it, though. That's the problem. John chapter 6. Religious people tend to be the worst on this. John chapter 6, verse 41. The Jews then complained about him, talking about Jesus, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How, how is this then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. Stop murmuring, stop complaining, let it go. It's, it's just the truth. Go down to uh, Philippi, uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Let's do that one first. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. And this is referencing back to what I read you about the Exodus. Nor complaining as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. So he's bringing this up even in the New Testament. Go to Philippians 2, 14. And he said, well, this isn't in the Bible. Like, I'm reading you the verses. This is straight up in the scriptures. Philippians 2, 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing. So people say, oh, these are the big sins. Don't be, don't be sliding your, your, oh, this is a little sin. It's not if it's your sin. Now here's what people may not ever consider. If the Bible says do all things without complaining and disputing, and you're doing that, then there's a possibility you need to go to God with that and repent. And you say, God, you say not to do this. This is who I am. I don't want to be this person anymore. So I confess to you my sin of this. Complaining and disputing. I'm always complaining. I'm always arguing. It's, it's never enough. So I confess it. I repent of it. I will stop doing this. For some people, stopping this category is as hard as someone else not drinking. They can't help themselves. In the flesh, they are going to turn into this person. Now you say, well, what difference does it make if you change, if it even works out and you, and you change your life? So let me tell you something about people who are around you, your family, everyone who's around you uh, consistently. They know who you are. If I went to your office, went to your neighborhood, wherever you, wherever you live and move and breathe and have your being, and I said, is this person... Female dog, female dog, female dog all the time. Absolutely. Never happy, complaining, everything's negative. And that were to change in your life and you went back into your home, back into your neighborhood, back into your workplace, and all of a sudden that's not who you are anymore, people are going to say, okay, what happened? Because nobody can change stuff like that. And now you're positive, now you're trusting, now you're not all wound up, now you're not making it a nightmare for everybody around you. There's, there's, even in that, people are going to ask a reason for the hope that's within you. Okay, so how did you change? Dude, you're not the same person. If Jesus cannot change our lives, what are we doing? You say, well, but I, I became a Christian at six and, and now I'm going to die and go to heaven. That's not all there is to this salvation in a moment is not the same thing as, 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 as sanctification over a period of time. We're okay, yeah, you got born again. Yes, you're going to heaven. But if your life still looks and sounds like hell, it's not working. And no one's buying your Jesus. But when they see, okay, you say you got saved, and then they see some gradual growth and change, then they go, okay, wait. Now, this is something else. Because you didn't just claim to meet Jesus. It looks like you're getting to know him and your life's looking more like him every day. And now they, the life that Jesus lived is the life people are looking for. Whether they know that or not, who he is and was and will always be is what people are looking for. And the more of that they see in us, the more drawn they are to him in us. And then you got a shot. Because you, then, you're, then you're real. You say, you knew me before. I was a piece of work. 
I was angry, my language, my whatever it was you, you were and did. And they go, yeah, dude, you're not the same person. So look, I'm not telling you I'm, I'm, I'm perfect. I was that, I'm here now, there's room for improvement. But I'm telling you, Jesus cannot just, he won't just change your eternity, he can change your life. Your marriage, your children, your family, everything about you, he can change it. And who doesn't want that if, they, if they're tired of feeling bad and their life sucks and, and, and they don't want to live this way anymore? James chapter 5, verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren. Now, what does that word brethren mean? That means this is directed at believers. This is not talking about the world. This is directed at believers, Christians. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. God, God's not messing around with this stuff. Here's, here's my favorite. This is borderline going to another message um, uh, about gossip, but one of my favorites is people that say, well, I promised I wouldn't tell anybody this, but, but just as a matter of prayer, I think we need to be praying with Shirley Jean, you know, because I think she's sleeping with Bobby Tom, you know, and... <laughs> Or Billy Bobby, or whatever his name is. Like, what are, what are you doing? Keep your mouth shut. God watches all this. He listens to all this. He, we are family. Right? And while we're on this, if you are a spouse, especially you're a spouse, and either in the presence of your spouse or in their absence, you are tearing down your spouse. You are destroying your marriage. Well, she just does that and he's just that way. And blah, blah, blah. you know, you say, well, I'm just trying to work it out. Why don't you pray it out first and see if you get there. And then if you haven't worked it out, praying it out, then maybe you find someone that you trust that will look at you and say, no, I'm not doing this with you. You want to make an observation about something that could improve and you're praying that God will change that, great. But to sit here and shred your husband or shred your wife, I'm not here for that. And this word, by the way, in James 5, 9, stenazo, I never tell you what it is in Greek, like, who cares? I, don't, I mean, what does that even mean? Synodza. Okay, that's what it means. Anybody going to use that at work tomorrow? Probably not. Okay. Which can mean to groan, sigh, or murmur in dissatisfaction. Just, uh, he's, just a, he's just a slug. He won't do anything. She's just a... Anyhow, enough of that. 1 Peter 4, 9. Uh, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Uh, maybe you don't know this. The word hospitality uh, and the whole hospitality industry comes straight out of the Bible. The word, if you have the gift of hospitality, the word hospitality comes from two Greek words that mean lover of strangers. So someone in the hospitality industry, stranger walks in, boom, they love them like, how are you? Glad you're here to stay with us. Um, so he says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So how does that work? Your wife informs you, oh, I've invited a bunch of people to come stay with us for a week. What? <laughs> There's your verse. Stop grumbling. What if that's her gift and God's going to use her to take care of some people? This is my space. No, it's not. It's his space. It's his house. Well, I'm not happy. Here we go. Now, flip way back to Job chapter 1 and verse 20. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. The, un the kraken gets unleashed on Job. Loses all of his possessions. All 10 children dead. He gets all this news in one day. 
And when, when things, tragic things like this happen, even at this level, you, you find yourself at a fork in the road and you have to know what you're going to do before you get there or you're going to default to the flesh. The reason Job got picked in the first place for all this stuff is that God knew he would not buckle. But Job 120 says, then Job arose, when he hears all, his children are dead, everything's gone. Then Job arose, he tore his robe, which is a sign of grief, shaved his head, same thing, shave your head, sign of grief, and he fell to the ground and worshiped. He did not fall on his face and go, ah, why me? You say, well, that, we would understand if someone did that. This is not about living a life where people go, oh yeah, that's what I would do. This is about living a life where people go, well, that's not what I would do. How are you doing that? I would complain. Why are you not complaining? Are you crazy or something? Your whole family's dead, except for you and your wife. Why are you not upset? It's not that he's not upset. He's not complaining. He's worshiping. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. No complaint. And if he had, you'd just say, well then why did God pick Job? If he was all that, see we think if you're godly that somehow being godly and complaining don't go together. So when I hear a Christian complaining, I assume they're only a few weeks old spiritually or they would never be living that way. And then you ask him a question. Well, how long have you been a Christian? When did you get saved? When I was 10. Dude, you're 75. What are you doing? You're still a whining, complaining fool. You're changing nothing. You're reaching no one. Because you're so negative, you're eating up with it. You can't whine and worship at the same time. You can't do it. It's not possible. Now, you may come into a space like this, we gather as a church, and the music cranks up, and you're in a bad spot. And you don't wanna sing. You know, it's not about putting your hands up and worshiping, you got your hands in your pocket. You got, you got Velcro gloves on and Velcro in your pockets. They're not coming out. I'm not happy. Well, maybe while everyone around you is worshiping, you stand there, and that's when you start to process it because you didn't do it before. And you go, Lord, I'm so upset. I'm so angry. And he's, he's patient. He's kind, right? And he goes, well, I know what's going on, so let's talk about it. I don't want to worship you. I'm upset with you. But I need to worship you because my way is not working. I need my hands up. I need, I, need to be, I need to be close to you because I've defaulted to the old me and it's, it's destroying me and my marriage and my children and everything around me. So what do you do? You say, Lord, I confess my whining, my complaining, my grumbling, my murmuring, all this that is not trusting you. You confess your sins and what does he, the book say? He is faithful, he is just to forgive you of your sin, to cleanse you of all unrighteousness and just like that, the hands come out. And you worship forward. Psalm 107 verse one is repeated a number of times. I won't read you but one of them. But this is what it says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Absolutely. So you say, well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm mad at God. I'm mad at everybody. I'm mad at me. I'm just mad. I'm, 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 I'm upset. I'm going to complain. You can't stop me. I get that. But he can stop you. He can allow it to get so bad you don't want to complain anymore. You want your good God back and your mercy back. Revelation 15, verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, 
and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. <laughs> and then look at this. They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So I encourage you to do this. Get it. Get you some of that. So you say, well, I'm in a bad place. Well, go to a good place. Go to his presence. Go to his word. Read his word. And you say, but God, I don't even know what to say to you. Say that. If you're by yourself, make up a little song to go with it. And say, oh, here, here's, here's my Moses song, God. I'm tired. I don't want to be, I don't want to live the old way anymore. And the last one is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Now, I'm saying all this to you, and I've shared this specifically before. The old man that helped me so much, Claude. Uh, one day he said, we're sitting there, and he said, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and, and told me to read these verses. And so here's what I read. Rejoice always. So how often does that say to rejoice? Always. Yeah, so pretty, pretty simple English. People say, I don't understand the Bible. I'm like, dude, really? Rejoice always. I don't understand that. No, you don't want to do it. That's why you don't understand it. Pray without ceasing. How often should you pray? Always. Without ceasing. And then where he really sent me was verse 18. So I read it to him. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. How many people come to me and say, oh, can you help me know what God's will is for my life? I'm like, yeah, but you're not going to like it. Because <laughs> here's one of them. The other one is that you avoid sexual, you know, all this. Oh, no, 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 I don't mean that. I mean like my job. Oh, no, you don't want to change. You just want specifics about stuff you don't care, you know, that he doesn't care about. So I read this to him. And, and mocked him. And I said, oh, great. So my mother dies. This was exactly what I said. So my mom dies. I'm going to go, oh, God, thank you so much that my mother died. And, and, I, and I went on. Boom, just kept female dog, female dog, female dog. About what he had had me read. And I finally finished my little tirade of complaint. And I said, I'm not doing that. And this is all he said back to me. You will. And that was it. And he left me alone. And I went back to my ways until my ways broke me. And part of what broke me is that old man didn't just read me verses, he lived verses. And the joy that he, that he had and that I wanted he was showing me how to get it. The peace that he had that I so desperately needed, he was showing me how to get it. The, the long, all that fruit, all the fruit on his tree, I had none of it. And I kept watching him and going, he has what I want. And he's giving me instruction about how to get it, but I refuse, I am stiff-necked, I will not yield. And finally my pain got so great and the desire for what he had was so great that I remember, I've told this story before, but on a given day, I finally said, okay, God, I don't, I don't understand this. I don't want to do it. I am taking a, ma a massive, feelingless step of faith, but I will do what you said. And in that moment, in that situation, I said, okay, God, this is not good, but I thank you anyway. And my whole life changed. Because when you get in a situation, and it's, it, it, sure, it's easy to, to thank God for things that are good. We barely do that. 
And there are situations where things are terrible, and the Bible describes that as a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It's going to cost you something to thank him because you're in pain. But finally, I realized that when the thing was, is not a good thing, but when I thanked him for it anyway, and, and it says, because this is the will of God in, in Christ Jesus for you, then it had to be right. And it was. And I begin to trust him and look for opportunities in that situation. Now, you say, well, that's just positive thinking. The little train that could eventually can't because the, the mountain is bigger than your can. You can't anymore at some point. This is the word and power of God in your life. And you say, well, I don't believe it. I'm, I get it. I've been there before. But I'm telling you, you will. He will allow things to happen and finally break you where you say, okay, Lord, I will thank you and find yourself trusting him at the same time. You say, well, you don't understand. I hate my husband. I hate my wife. I don't like my situation. And what I'm telling you is the will of God is to say, God, I do not like my situation, but I trust you. So I thank you for this husband that I have. I thank you for this wife that I have. I thank you for this disease, whatever it is you have that you don't like. And then all of a sudden, that wave that was about to crush you, you find yourself up on a board of faith riding it to the beach. So you say, well, that's none of that's my problem. I don't like my life. Well, I'd first ask you this, are you even a Christian? And you say, well, no. God will mess it up. I doubt he's going to do any worse with it than you are. What if you stop complaining about your life and turn it over to him and see what he can do with it? You say, but what about all the, the bad apple Christians? Here's what I'm going to do. I, I get you those people exist. I can be one of those. Have you ever met someone who claimed to be a Christian who you thought that's a genuine, real follower of Jesus? And you go, yeah. Then say, Jesus, I want that. I want that you. I don't want the name, just the name. I want that that I saw in that man or woman. I want, to be, I want that change. You say, well, how do I get it? You say, God, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I've complained about my life, but I've never given you a shot with it. So I yield finally. I trust you. I, 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 I have sinned, but I understand now that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and raised from the dead to save me. So I, I accept the forgiveness of my sins, the gift of eternal life, and I ask you to come live in me, through me, change me. Not just give me a ticket to heaven, but change my life over time so that people will know I know you. In Jesus' name, amen. And he moves in just like that. So if you prayed that prayer, you just became a Christian. There's a couple sitting in the middle right here today. A couple weeks ago in the lobby, going out the door, both of them sat on a little bench out there and prayed and became Christians. It didn't take long, but it did take a lot because your Savior had to hang on a cross, shed his blood, suffer and die, be buried and raised from the dead to make it so simple. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Um, for putting up with us. It's just, that's still astonishing to me. In terms of just existence in the universe, we, we're not even the size of dust. We're, we're nothing. But yet you know that we are here. And even Jesus showed up here and did what it took to get us there. So first of all, Lord, for anybody who just prayed or needs to pray and in the complaining about why life doesn't work without even giving you a shot, um, I pray that you'll change that today for people in this room and beyond. And for those of us who are Christians, Lord, and never even contemplated that murmuring, complaining, griping, whining, could be categorized as a sin. I pray that we would repent, Lord, if that's our deal. 
and let you change our hearts, our minds, our approach to life in our interaction with spouses, children, coworkers, even strangers. And everyone know that it's more of you than ever before and less of us, the old us. We love you, we trust you, we praise you, we worship you, we thank you, we look forward to seeing you in person. And until then, uh, let us be found faithful on this side. And our prayer is even so, come Lord Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen. All right, for everybody in the room, first of all, if you do have the registration card down toward the bottom, there's a place you could check off. Uh, I prayed today to receive the gift of eternal life. If you prayed a simple prayer and you know God moved in, please indicate that. Uh, anything else there applies, check that off. If you, if you became a Christian, especially, and you don't have a pen or a pencil, just tear off those three crosses on the bottom right-hand corner, fold it up, and put it in the baskets when they come by during the offering. Um, and if you're listening and watching somewhere else beyond here, send us an email, reunion at reunionchurch.org. And uh, just say, I prayed. I know I became a Christian. I need help. I need encouragement. I need to connect with somebody where I live. We'll do whatever we can to help do that uh, wherever you are on the planet. We're, uh, we're game. Okay. Whoever's got the baskets, let's do that. We'll sing a song. We'll be on our way. Um, pray everybody has a safe Thanksgiving. Um, and that there's more of that going around. More thanksgiving. A little update. I said something the other day about eventually we've got to move out of here and we're working on a, on a spot. Uh, we haven't, the elders are still discussing this. We're not going to get ourselves in a situation that we can't follow through with, but we're getting close. We're talking about it again this week. And so not withholding any information, just don't have anything definitive to tell you. But um, one way or another, it's getting close because uh, we got to find a new spot. And if this is the one, then that's good. Um, uh, where's Michael? Michael's an Uber driver. And the uh, location I described as a possibility, he came up to me, kind of eyes and says, you know, that's a nightclub. I'm like, yeah. He says, dude, I drove some people over there the night. Like, it's, it's crazy. I'm like, yeah. And aren't those the people that we're looking for, right? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Not the cleaned up, not the nicely dressed, the lost. So you better get your fishing shoes on because we're about to go to work. So it's good. <laughs> I told her, I keep telling people this, like, dude, I got friends, like, they're winding down. They're about to buy some property and go hide in the woods. Like, I feel like it's all starting all over again. It's, it's unbelievable. Let's go. You know, it's exciting. Okay. Everybody, all that's covered. Anything else we need to say? Everybody up. Let's sing our way out of here. Love you guys. God bless you. And uh, we'll see you soon.